So I ordered this YD100 engine kit off of Amazon from the Bicycle Motor Works uh, store. And this owner's manual came in the mail before the engine did. Yeah, it's the same standard capacity tank. The first time I used one of these trigger lock clutch levers, I didn't care for it, but it really grew on me. And um, after seeing uh, my girl struggle to try and push down the button on the standard clutch lever, I decided that these trigger lock ones are the way to go. They're a lot more intuitive to use and easier for somebody with smaller hands or weaker hands comes with the four bolt chain tensioner. It's a little more work to get it onto the bike, but they just stay on more secure and they inspire more confidence. Not really much else I'm expecting to see different in here. Um, this is a red and black wire. CDI with a red spark plug cable. A significant restriction in the outlet. I don't know if you guys can see it, but um, there's a bead of solder, or weld, whatever you want to call it, on the inside of this pipe. Here's the cap of this pin. Right, so the cap fits in here, right? But it doesn't go down. Uh, the diameter of the outlet on the uh, inside of this pipe is thinner than the lid of this pin. Um, I'm not gonna bother to measure that. You guys know that that's pretty, pretty thin. I don't normally do unboxings, and I'm sure you guys have already seen unboxings of the YD100, uh, but I am curious if they're still putting the pistons in backwards. Oh, she's a good girl. She's a big girl. <laughs> um, immediately upon pulling it out of the box, I see some things that are a little concerning, um, which makes me afraid of what I'm gonna see on the inside, but I do have high hopes for this motor. I'm hoping that any issues there are, we can catch them right away and just be good to go. Yeah, nice, fat, just like my triple 40 mounting will be able to fit onto modern steel frame bikes. Thank you. It's a 13 millimeter. You know, on motors I've bought in the past, I usually put the spark plug in. It's a Z8C with an LD on the back. Don't know if that means anything to anyone. any of that to fall into the case, man. Okay, the pins are on the intake side. The cylinder has lubricant on it. The arrow, for whatever it's worth, is pointing towards the exhaust. This clip looks good. This clip looks kind of iffy. Doesn't look like it's quite seated all the way on the bottom. Well, I pushed it down with my finger and the top one popped up. I'm going to take this clip out. I'm not sure if you guys can see, but this clip is only seating on the bottom or the top. It's not pushing out into the, into the indention all the way. I've heard bad things about these clips before. This is a very soft metal. 50.01 Now when I first pulled the motor out of its box I mentioned that I saw a few things that looked kind of concerning and uh, one of them was this little chip here on the intake and just this roughness on the head. Now I realize this is casting flaws but I was concerned if it looked this rough on the outside it might not look so great on the inside but uh, the ports and the cylinder, to me, look pretty good. It's the new Red Ranger! For the YD100 build, I decided to go with another Roadmaster Granite Peak 26-inch mountain bike. It wouldn't be my first choice, but as far as trails bike goes, it's really the only option Walmart had at the time. Ideally, I plan on putting this motor onto the 2020 Swin TAF, 
which will require some slight modifications or fabrications for a lower engine mount. However, that bike seems to have some really nice features. The build quality is excellent. And for the price, I don't think you can go wrong. Although it is a 27 and a half inch mountain bike, and I've had bad luck with the... Uh, <clears throat> the wheels is set up on those in the past I still think that's a fantastic frame so in the future expect to see this motor on another bike however at the time this bike has been doing pretty good with the Zeta triple 40 build uh, we did a couple weeks ago uh, I didn't really run into any problems putting a motor on the bike it's a slight tight fit but it was still a heck of a lot easier than my original build the uh, mongoose hot shot with the Zeta Triple Forty, it fit just fine and had just enough room so no cables were smashed against the top of the bike. You could still get the uh, air filter on and off with a little bit of maneuvering. Anyways, this is a cheap bike. It's a mountain style bike, but we will say a light trail bike at the most. It's not designed to be subjected to heavy use, and I'm keeping that in mind. But while we plan on putting the motor on this we're going to do as much as we can to get as much life out of the bike as possible checking all the bearings adding extra grease adjusting anything that's loose or over tightened we started out by debadging the bike removing every single sticker I could find on the bike as well as all the reflectors now I'm doing the reflectors because I just really like the way it's gonna look as a we'll say blank bike but if you plan on using your bike on the road I recommend not getting rid of the reflectors as those are required by law in a lot of states if you plan on using these on the road will you get in trouble for the reflectors no but if you do get pulled over it's just one extra thing they can add to the list of things you're doing wrong anyways the crank set on this particular frame was a little tight so we decided to go ahead and adjust it as well as the rear wheel bearing. The front wheel bearings on this bike were actually spot on, but we did take out the shaft and add in grease. However, the rear ones were a little stiff, and you can see as I'm holding it in my hand, spinning the tire actually spins the entire shaft, which tells me that the bearings or the, the cup and cone is too tight. I'm taking these precautions or preventative maintenance measures before I put the motor kit on the bike because it's just a lot easier to deal with not having all that extra weight and the motor kit in the way. I also like to put anti-seize on the threads of the freewheel because if you ever have to take that off in the future, it's a bear and sometimes damn near impossible. Now to adjust and repack the wheel bearings, this is a job that's a lot easier if you have a vise. Uh, but I found a way to do it with a pair of vice grips. And these had a fair bit of grease on them from the factory, so that was nice. But I'm going to get pretty liberal with the grease on this one. Now, adjusting the cup and cone to get just the right bearing tension, I guess you would say, can be a bit of a headache if you've never done it before, or even if you've done it a couple of times, you know that it, it's tricky. It can take about a dozen times to get it right. On this bike, I got incredibly lucky, and I got it right on the first try. But getting it to spin freely but not wobble is, uh, is pretty tricky, and in some instances, you might end up with just a little bit of wobble, but that's okay, as long as the bearings aren't too tight and the wheel is not slopping all over the place. I'm also going to remove the liner, tire, inner tube. I'm going to check the entire rim and the uh, spoke caps to make sure there's no burrs, no sharp edges that's going to cut through the liner into the inner tube. I also like to take a bit of sandpaper and go over the valve hole, the valve stem hole, because I've had these cut through valve stems in the past. adding a cheap tire liner which won't really help about for nails and screws staples things like that as a matter of fact while testing I actually had a staple go right through it but it will d definitely help against burrs goat heads and any kind of plant material organic things that might poke into your inner tube I also checked the headset and on this bike it was fine it wasn't loose and it moved freely and just an FYI, if you have wobble in your freewheel, new bikes, used bikes, this is completely normal. I've seen this on every bike.
Lay down. Yeah. Yeah. I won't confuse this with women's intuition, because with men it's different. Women's intuition is usually right. But I'll tell you, men get a lot more fun out of a good hunch than they do out of a solid fact. It's not smart or correct, but it's one of the things that makes us what we are. When truing the wheels on these cheaper bikes, I like to find the seam and I like to mark it. The reason I do this is because sometimes where the seams meet, uh, the rim can have a bulge or it can have a low spot that's not actually caused by improper adjustments on the spokes. So if you try to true out that spot, you might run into issues that will just confuse you. On this bike, it was fine on the front wheel, but the rear wheel seam had a small bulge in it, so I was able to ignore that section. And we got pretty pretty close on this wheel, so we're not going to get it absolutely perfect, just good enough. Removing your uh, grips on this particular bike, hold on to them, because you'll use them for a couple other things during the build. Uh, two spots that are easy to forget. Check your headset bolt, check your handlebar bolt, make sure they're nice and tight. You don't want to find out during the test ride that one of those was loose. It's just annoying at the least. An advantage of having multiple builds in the past is holding on to some parts that might come in handy. I found that on one of my old bikes, I had a nice longer brake lever, which allowed me to put both brakes on one side of the bike stacked over top of each other like this. And I debated using a dual brake lever on this bike, but since I'll probably be using this on a lot of trails, I decided not to go with the dual brake lever like we did on the Triple Forty build. Triple Forty is just kind of a backup bike, not specifically designed for trails, but the YD100 I'm building for trails. And the reason I like to have the ability to use the rear brake independently is because on loose terrain, sometimes you want to just use your rear brake and not your front. A little tip I have for putting on the throttle assembly, I like to use a bit of tape or some hot glue on those nuts on the bottom mount so that they don't fall out every time you try and screw them in. Now this is pretty straightforward. We're just gonna go ahead and drill in the uh, hole for the stud to keep the throttle in position. Now I wasn't sure how the rear wheel setup on this bike was going to work out. I really want to use the 56 tooth sprocket but at this point I don't know if that's going to work for a number of reasons. A smaller frame, smaller rear wheel might run into clearance issues so I ordered that spring tensioner just in case. Now here's another tip for the throttle. If you've ever had a bike long enough, you probably run into this situation where the throttle no longer stops in the forward position. And that's because these two little wings that hold the cable into position, they collapse inwards. They don't actually break, they just kind of get squished together. So you can use anything you want really as long as it's removable. I like to use hot glue because when it dries it hardens up enough so that the throttle the little wings that hold in the throttle cable won't get squished, they'll stay spread out, and then I'll have a stop on my throttle, so the forward position won't just keep twisting forward. We got the new muffler on the right and an old PK81 on the left. They're identical, the inlets and outlets are the same diameter. One might look a little different because it's used, but I assure you, they're the same diameter. The internals are built the same way as far as I can tell. Now for the cylinder uh, exhaust port, the YD100 is indeed larger diameter than a standard PK80 China doll. Um, it's probably hard to tell on the camera, but I matched the gaskets up to them and I could tell that the YD100 had a larger port. It wasn't significant, a few millimeters maybe. I bought this uh, flexible little exhaust uh, here and might use it in the future. I'm not sure what bike I'm going to put it on. I'll probably end up trying it on the YD100. Now the stock muffler that came with this kit had some crap rattling around on the inside. Turns out it was slag from the welds. These little metal beads. It's unlikely but definitely possible that these could get sucked back into the motor due to how two strokes work with their exhaust system. So I decided to go ahead and drain that out best I could. Tap it to break anything loose. Don't want that to get sucked into the cylinder. Color coordination from the engine wires to the CDI wires is matched up, which made it nice and easy to connect those without guessing. 
Um, there's no color coordination on the kill switch because that's not polarized, so you can put either color on either side. It doesn't matter. Removing this cover to grease these gears, make sure you do this slowly, kind of rock it back and forth so you don't tear this gasket. It's pretty easy to tear. It's not the end of the world if you do. You can seal it up with a silicone liner, but it just keeps dirt and debris out of this case. I remove the spark plug to make this gear easy to turn by hand, and then I add quite a liberal amount of grease because these, uh, these gears had absolutely no grease on them at all. I probably add more than I need to, but eh, that's fine. I also put a little bit on both sides of the gasket. Makes it easy to take off in the future. Then I get myself a penny. This is something I should have did before I greased it. But I wedge that penny up in there. This is the penny trick. And I use it to tighten this screw as hard as I can. Moving back over to the drive side of the bike, we go ahead and remove this cover to access the bucking bar and the drive sprocket. The bucking bar had no grease on it at all and something I forgot to do on a pass bike was grease this and it completely rounded out the corners which made activating the clutch uh, tricky. Also another thing that will happen if you don't grease this bar, this one had grease on it, but if it doesn't you need to make sure that this bearing and this bar is greased otherwise the tip of that bearing can flatten out. And if it flattens out, what will happen is you'll notice that your engine will no longer want to disengage from the rear wheel. That's usually caused by two things. Either that bar flattened out, it mushroomed out because it had no grease, or simple is that your clutch cable just came loose. I also like to take a 19 millimeter socket, a bit of old chain, and tighten up that uh, nut that holds on that sprocket as well. I've had one of those come loose before and I caught it just in time before it could cause damage. But if it does come completely loose, you'll probably wreck your engine case. And I take this opportunity to put in a bit of two-stroke oil into the cylinder. I just do this to add a little extra oil because when you're starting the bike for the first time that's uh, that's the motor's scariest moment. Now make sure you put something under the muffler because it's likely that it's going to drip down the muffler if you forgot to put the cylinder at top dead center. And even if you did it'll probably still find its way down there anyways. Now the clutch cable uh, that comes for this build is really long. We're going to go ahead and shorten it up using a Dremel, a pair of snips, um, and some sandpaper to bevel out the edge. Now these kits come with two springs. We know that the larger spring is a heat shield to protect the cable from the heat of the motor. And the smaller spring is to help assist in returning the clutch to the engaged position. I just like to remove the small spring. I don't know if this has any detriment effects in the long run. If you guys know of any issues caused by not using the small spring, let me know in the comments. But I've been omitting it from most of my builds because it's just a lot easier to pull the clutch in without that small spring. And now the nightmare begins. Other than a few minor adjustments and cleaning up some of the bits on the bike, there's really not much else I have to do other than add the sprocket. And because I really, really wanted to use the 56 tooth sprocket on this 26 inch frame, I ran into a lot of issues. I'm just going to cover the highlights from here on out, so my audio commentary is probably not going to match everything that's happening in the video. Think of the video as just a montage going on in the background. Now, when I built the other bike, identical frame, but with a Zeta Triple Forty using all the stock parts that come on a standard kit, I didn't run into any issues at all. The rag joint fit just fine. I was able to get it true, uh, and the entire motor kit was fine. The chain clearance was all good, but because I, the 56-2 sprocket is huge, and this is a smaller bike, so I ran into clearance issues with the chain rubbing up against the frame when I used the rag joint because the spacers on the rag joint pushed the sprocket out too far and that would cause the chain to hit the bottom bar and get popped off the sprocket. So I decided to try 
for the third time to use the one inch clamp on hub adapter. Now, I have nothing against cl uh, clamp on hub adapters. I think that on larger hubs, they are great, but on a one inch hub, for a cheap bike where the hub is really thin and there's not a lot of space to work with. It is just something that in my own experience, I highly recommend not using. If you have a one inch hub on your rear wheel, please don't use the hub adapter unless you really know what you're doing. If this is your first attempt at using a clamp on adapter, don't do it on a one inch. Uh, it mounts fine as far as running true, but you will not get it to stop slipping. I tried to key the hub and I also tried to add a set screw. I knew the key by itself wasn't going to work because the hub was too thin and it would just eat right through it. So I thought using a set screw along with the key would help. That didn't help at all. The bike immediately slipped, stripped out the keyway and uh, just collapsed a small section of the hub where the set screw was. So we needed to come up with something that was going to work. I decided to go back to a fail-safe uh, quick steel epoxy putty. I was pretty sure this wasn't going to work, but that stuff had done some amazing things for me in the past. So I decided what I would do is take the Dremel and put a bunch of slots in the clamp and on the hub so that I could give the, the quick steel something to bite onto. And that didn't work, of course. That immediately just slipped right through. So I could not use the clamp-on hub adapter on this bike. All my attempts to prevent it from slipping and bending the spokes, which it was doing quite severely, uh, were just leading to more damage done to a hub on a brand new rim. Now, eventually, I'll be replacing this rear wheel with a heavy-duty one, probably one designed specifically for motorized bikes where you can just bolt the sprocket right on to the... A rim. Shit. Good compression. It didn't hold? Nah. I'll try something else. And since nothing's working with the clamp on, we decided to go back to the rag joint and see what we could do. Kind of think outside the box and look for modifications. And that's where I came up with this idea. The reason the sprocket wasn't working with the rag joint, the only reason was just that one of the rubber spacers on the outside of the spokes was pushing the sprocket too far towards the frame. And that caused the chain to rub, as I mentioned, and pop off. So I thought, well... It, I can't remove the spacer. You have to have a spacer on both sides of the spokes because the rag joint clamps onto the spokes. And if there's not a spacer on one side, say the sprocket side, it'll actually pull the spokes towards the sprocket instead of clamping them. And that would just cause a lot of new problems. Uh, but I needed the sprocket to be closer to the hub so it wouldn't rub the chain on the frame and I decided well what if I just cut 
this spacer in half. Which is something I didn't think was really going to be easy to do, but actually it turned out to be a lot easier than I thought. It still wasn't a cakewalk, and it took a little while, but with a fresh, brand new, sharp blade on my razor cutter, I was able to slice straight down the middle and cut this spacer in half. Once I did that, I test fit it to the bike, and I saw that it was going to work for getting the sprocket close to the hub, but the top the, the higher portion of the spokes still did not have enough material to prevent them from getting pulled. So I decided to add another ring to the top layer of the spacer. And lo and behold, it worked. Because the YD100 comes with a one-piece cylinder, it makes it kind of tricky to install and remove the spark plug, given the fact that it's on the top of the motor and close to the frame. So after modifying the spark plug tool, so I'd have a tool on hand in case I needed to diagnose a problem, and checking the spark plug to see if I'm running rich or lean, it looks pretty good to me. Oh. YD100 with a 56 tooth sprocket. There's a Zeta triple 40 with a 44 tooth sprocket. Oh, quite well broken in though. I guess he doesn't need a break.
viewer request, as soon as I find my 10 millimeter. Feels good in the shade though, I'll tell you what, with that breeze blowing. Ratio. Okay, guys, you ready to hear a wow son of a bitch? Well, if you ever wanted to turn your two-stroke into an instant four-stroke, removing the muffler cap on the YD100 is a good way to go. Uh, there was no performance gains whatsoever, but a viewer had requested a removal of the muffler cap just so they could hear what it sounded like, and I figured since we had the Sony with the external microphone, we get a pretty good sense of that. The pitch and tone of the engine sounds spot on through the speakers, but what you guys are not getting is how ridiculously loud this was. This was obnoxious. I did not enjoy riding this down the trail. I'm not against loud motors, just this was this was over the top. This was too much. Riding this through a neighborhood is just to get attention and would piss off your neighbors. It four-stroked in the low RPMs, bogged in the mid RPMs, and never got to the high RPMs. Although I'm in the brake and I didn't really try to push it to high RPMs because that's just not a good idea, there was definitely no performance gain and it was lackluster at best. It is so loud. I don't know, anybody who would want to ride with the muffler cap out, 